Okay, so it's six o'clock, so we'll go and get started. My name is Bryant McAllister, and this is the monthly meeting, or the main meeting, the DNA interest group. Uh, some new faces, and so welcome. Uh, this group meets monthly, the fourth Tuesday of each month. We're back now in room A of the Iowa City Public Library, um, and the plan will be to meet uh, in this room um, as, as necessary, but I actually lack the digital media lab, and so we may uh, have some of our meetings scheduled in there as that's available as well and as appropriate for, for meetings that uh, would be better in that location. The one benefit of being in here is that uh, we can record this meeting and have that available for you to review um, uh, for the video audio uh, that's on the library news channel. If you haven't been to our Facebook page, we do have a Facebook page, DNA Interest Group, and the recordings that are available of the la last meetings uh, are always tied to the, to the previous events that we've had uh, through that Facebook page. And so that's one way that you can uh, see the video from previous meetings. Um, so tonight, we're going to focus on pharmacogenomics, or how genes inform drug therapy. Uh, in June, we have a plan to tackle uh, this new story that recently um, hit in terms of uh, DNA genealogy GEDmatch as a, a database that many of you have data in, and that being used as part of, uh, of, of finding the suspect in the Golden State Killer case. Uh, and so we'll address uh, those particular issues uh, at our June meeting, uh, which will be the fourth Tuesday in June. Actually, I have it written down on that piece of paper that's sitting in that chair up there on what date that is, uh, but uh, it's the fourth Tuesday in, in June that we'll have that meeting. Uh, if you're on the email list, uh, you'll get an email about it, update on the Facebook page, the library's webpage um, for information on that. Tonight, the focus is going to be on genes and their effects on, um, on pharmaceuticals, and so uh, tailoring drug uh, uh, treatments uh, to individual genetic variation. Uh, tonight's presentation is going to be by Hovana um, Mistorovich. Um, and so uh, she's graduated from the biology program a year ago and has just finished her first year of uh, the pharmacy program here at the University of Iowa. Uh, and then uh, she also is just starting her master's of public health program as well uh, here at the University of Iowa. And so she's going to present uh, tonight's program on pharmacogenomics. So, Havana. Hi, thank you all for showing up. I see a lot of new faces, so thank you. So pharmacogenomics, um, oh, I see. Oh. All right, so this presentation is hopefully gonna be focused on defining what pharmacogenomics is and explaining how genetic variations are related to drug me metabolism and then how that's related to drug therapy. So really the importance of how pharmacogenomics um, influences drug therapies. Um, in the presentation, you might see shorthand PGX. That's shorthand for pharmacogenomics, just a little easier. Um, and then I also kind of want to uh, explore direct-to-consumer and clinical resources for pharmacogenomics information. So what is pharmacogenomics? Um, it's the study of how genetic variations influence drug response. So, um, if you don't know, uh, right there is uh, the genetic code, and you'll see oh, there are three people, and they're sequenced DNA right there. And in this specific location, there are differences in one single nucleotide. Those are called SNPs for shorthand. Those differences are seen among the population. And then when given a drug treatment, it's been found that some people, based on their differences at those locations, um, influence whether or not the drug is effective, non-effective, and sometimes even whether or not there are severe side effects associated with that drug. 
So knowing this information can help doctors decide what medications or what doses are best for people to use for individual patients. It can change which medication a doctor prescribes. It can change what dose they start a person on. And its uses are very important. And so now the question is, how do you go from these single nucleotide differences into a whole response. So a little bit about the drug process in the body. Um, so drug metabolism is the conversion of one molecule, aka the drug, into a molecule with a different chemical structure. So generally that's going to happen in the liver for most drugs. Um, you ingest the drug um, and it'll go through your GI tract and then go into your circulation, get into the liver, where the drug metabolism would happen. And then it'll go back out into the circulation and get eliminated through the kidneys. Or through an IV, it'll go into the bloodstream, then into the liver, and again, the same process of elimination. Um, so the enzymes that are in the liver that metabolize um, the drugs um, are encoded by genes. That's where that connection is. The genes encode the enzymes, which are then used to metabolize the drugs in the liver. So, start off with a standard drug and a standard, that's, sorry, the standard drug and the enzyme. Um, so what happens is the drug gets to the liver. And the enzyme changes it from an active drug, the active, uh, the little star uh, indicates active, meaning it'll have some type of pharmacological effect. And then it's converted into an inactive molecule. So that's for a standard drug. There are also prodrugs, in which case the drug itself isn't actually active, and the enzyme converts it into the active form. So that's an important distinction going forward because the terms used in pharmacogenomics um, can be confusing when you don't know that there are two different types of drugs. So there are four different classes of drug metabolism. Um, there are normal metabolizers. That's the majority of the population. Um, that's what the majority of FDA uh, um, labels specify for normal metabolizers. But then there's the subset of people that are either intermediate or p poor metabolizers. And so for standard drugs, that means that the enzymes do not work quite as well in those people. And so for standard drugs, they cannot get rid of the active drug um, as efficiently as normal metabolizers. Because the drug is in the system for so long or it's at such a high dose for so long, um, it can cause toxicities. So that could be related to adverse drug responses. Um, and intermediate metabolizers are uh, about one step down from normal metabolizers, and poor metabolizers or non-metabolizers would be even further. There are also rapid or ultra-rapid metabolizers. So for those people, the enzymes work too efficiently, or they have more than a normal person. Um, that can cause, uh, for standard drugs, for the uh, drug to be eliminated too quickly so that the drug levels never actually reach the optimal um, concentration. And so this is where the prodrug comes in, where you could have um, poor metabolizer of one drug causing reduced elimination and more toxicity, 
Whereas if you're talking about a prodrug, it could actually cause decreased effectiveness and decreased activation. Um, so as I said before, the prodrug is inactive when it gets into the body, and then the enzyme activates it. So um, for people who have either less of the enzyme or less functional enzymes, they cannot activate the drug as efficiently, so it never actually reaches that optimal concentration in the first place, and it just gets eliminated before it reaches that point. And ultra-rapid metabolizers of prodrugs activate the drug too efficiently or quickly, and so that can cause serious side effects or toxicity because of the skyrocket in concentration. So this is more of a visual representation of that. Um, so I only have it for the standard drug, but you'll see this is one example of um, how it might work in the body. Um, it's not always this way, but generally um, the normal metabolizer will have two copies of that gene, and they are normal, hence the term normal, or extensive metabolizer, that is another term for normal. Um, and you'll see the concentration in the body goes up and down, and this middle point right there is where the uh, um, effect is seen on the body, so the de desired effect. For the intermediate uh, metabolizers, one of those genes is either non-functional or just lowered functionality. And you'll see, again, that uh, peak in concentration. And for intermediate metabolizers, that might not mean that it's as toxic. But for poor metabolizers who might have no functional genes, meaning no functional enzymes, you'll see that the concentration is to a point that uh, toxicity is seen. And then for ultra-rapid metabolizers, it's possible that they have a gene, gene duplication. It's also possible that um, there could be a mutation in that gene that causes it to work more efficiently for some reason, though that's often not the case because our bodies generally know what's most effective. Um, and then you'll see here um, that the majority of people are that normal metabolizer. And lower amounts of people are in the other sections. So this is specific to this um, gene, but that curve is uh, generally seen, normal bell curve. So why are pharmacogenomics important? Um, well, knowing this type of information can change a prescriber's choice of drug. Um, they can choose not to use certain drugs, or they can change the dose. Um, it's estimated that adverse drug reactions are the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. That's not generally seen because most statistics don't look at that, but there's some data saying that that is true. Um, and it definitely, for sure, costs the healthcare system billions and billions of dollars um, due to those adverse reactions to drugs. Um, and also the FDA has added pharmacogenomics information on well over 100 drug labels and over 30 um, CPIC guidelines have been published. So CPIC is an organization that publishes pharmacogenomics um, information and guidelines. So there are plenty of drugs in which we have information like that to uh, base recommendations on. So, tacrolimus is an immunosuppressant that can be used for transplant patients. Um, this is a case, or not a case, but this is an example that I've seen firsthand. Um, so, ultra-rapid metabolizers of this drug eliminate the drug so quickly that it's not as effective as it normally would be. Um, you'll see about 5 to 15 percent of Caucasians, it's estimated, have um, our ultra-rapid metabolizers. Quite a few African Americans and some Asians. 
Um, so pharmacists and physicians encounter this situation, but they don't often do pharmacogenomic testing. That's because generally they try the drug, the normal standard dose, and then they look at their blood levels, and then they reevaluate the therapy based on where they should be. So after doing that, then they could increase the dose. They could, so if they find out that um, when they do the blood test, if they find that the blood levels are really low to the normal, that could indicate that they're ultra rapid metabolizers and that they're getting rid of the drug so fast, um, faster than normal. So in that case, they could increase the dose, but then the issue with that is it could be too high and it could cause those toxic effects even though the person gets rid of the drug really fast. Um, you could increase dose frequency, meaning so you'll give it more times during the day to keep, the, at, to keep it at a steady concentration. But if they're in the hospital, that might be okay. But if they go home, it's hard to, um, uh, it's hard for adherence. It's hard for someone to take a medication multiple times a day. Um, you could also switch to an extended form, extended dose form. Um, that could also be expensive, or it might not be covered by their insurance, or other issues with that. There might not be an extended form. Um, you could add an inhibitor, meaning, um, so an inhibitor of the enzyme will uh, decrease its effectiveness. So because it's so effective, you add another drug to decrease its effectiveness, and then it goes back to a somewhat normal level. But in that case, you're adding a whole other drug for the patient to be on. And so generally, that's not advised. Sometimes you get lucky, but um, it's not a recommendation. Or you can switch medications. But it would be nice if you knew the pharmacogenomics of that patient before you even started this process, or just to reassure you that you're doing the right thing. And so codeine is another example of a medication. In this case, it is a prodrug. Um, so that is metabolized into morphine for pain relief. Um, and there are cases of people who are ultra rapid metabolizers in which um, they have gone through uh, respiratory depression and even death due to opioid overdose. Generally, that's seen in um, young children. Um, it's not, it's a rare thing to happen, but it has happened. Um, in 2017, the FDA added a black box warning and made a safety uh, announcement recommending um, not using codeine and tramadol in children and breastfeeding mothers because of this connection. Um, so, and there you have ultra rapid metabolizers. 0.5 to 1% of Chinese, Japanese, and Hispanic populations, 1 to 10 of Caucasians, 3% in African Americans, and possibly up to 28% in North Africans, Ethiopians, and Arabs. So you'll see that there is quite a bit of difference, and that could be another uh, indicator that maybe you would test certain populations and not others. And Clopidogrel, or Plavix, is another example. It's a cardiovascular blood thinner used to prevent heart attacks and stroke. Um, it was the second best-selling drug for quite a few years and made over $9 billion in the year 2009. Um, but then in 2010, the FDA added a black box warning stating it wasn't effective in um, CYP2C19 poor metabolizers. Um, so these people um, did not metabolize the drug very well. Um, and it actually made heart attack more likely for those people. Um, estimates of about 20% in Asian populations and 5% in Caucasian and African populations are poor metabolizers. And intermediate metabolizers are about 60% in Asian populations and 30% in Caucasian populations. So that is quite a bit quite a large number of people who 
may not actually benefit as much as we had hoped from this medication. Um, there are people who obviously it works very, very well. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the second best selling drug. Um, but for some people, it might be a waste of money or a waste of time based on their genetics. And so I'm going to go through three different resources for pharmacogenomics information. So I'm sure plenty of you have heard about 23andMe, which is a genetic testing company. And they sell genetic tests and provide their raw genetic data as well as interpretations of that. Uh, Prometheus offers third-party genetic analysis, which many of you may or may not have heard of. And I doubt most of you have heard of uh, PharmGKB, which is a website that compiles uh, pharmacogenomics guidelines and annotations. Um, so 23andMe, right, it's a genetic testing company. Um, they offer reports on ancestry as well as health-related information. Um, so they used to offer customers reports on pharmacogenomics um, to medications and drug classes, but they no longer do that in the U.S. They still offer those uh, reports outside of the U.S., um, but they stopped doing that here in 2013, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but those ancestry reports cost about $99 or less here, and the health and ancestry cost about $200 and raw genetic data is provided with both of those tests. Um, but again, at this point, they do not offer any pharmacogenomics reports. So this is a list of the medications that they used to offer reports on and that they still offer um, outside of the US. And so all of these drugs have been found to be linked with these genes, some of them have multiple genes, as in the case of warfarin. Um, and then in those genes, um, you'll have specific variants that are associated with the different drug responses. So in pharmacogenomics, um, they have kind of a unique naming system. Um, so that star 2, star 1, star 3 is the different variants which you would have to just look up. There is no rhyme or reason as to um, how they name those, other than one is generally normal. Um, and then all of those variants are associated with these uh, SNP sites. So those are those single sites that 23andMe tests. Not all of them are uh, Function, the functional cause of this difference. Um, so some of them, it might actually be something else, but it's linked to um, that SNP, which is an indicator that the functional, um, the functional uh, difference variation is there. So the purpose of these tests are um, listed there, but generally they're all having to do with um, toxicity, drug efficacy, um, see their sensitivity, dose adjustments. Um, and then some of them um, have uh, FDA guidelines on what to do for people who, are, who have those variants. Um, some of them have no recommendations from the FDA or Farm GKB, um, uh, anyways, 23andMe, their timeline. Um, so the Human Genome Project, which is when the whole genome was sequenced, um, occurred in the early 2000s, depending on what you consider completed. Um, and uh, 23andMe, um, started around mid to late 2000s. Sorry, I must not have put that there. Um, but then in 2013, um, the FDA sent a letter to 23andMe banning them providing um, healthcare-related genetic reports to the public. So they took out all of their um, healthcare-related reports and were no longer allowed to get that information 
because the FDA decided that it was um, that they needed to get approval first because it was considered a device, a health healthcare device. Um, and then in 2015, after 23andMe um, attempted to get FDA approval, um, they allowed 23andMe to report on carrier status of healthcare results. So that's when um, one of your, your whether or not you um, are able to pass on um, one of those disorders to your children. Um, and then in 2017, the FDA approved um, 23andMe to report on genetic health risks. So that's, um, I'm sure you guys have heard about 23andMe now allowing um, reports on uh, BRCA, the gene related to uh, breast cancer. Um, so that's what that would uh, be indicating. Or they also have Alzheimer's disease, your risk of Alzheimer's, your risk of um, about 10 different um, genetic diseases. Currently, though, there are still no, uh, no classified pharmacogenomics um, results in 23andMe. Um, outside of 23andMe, there are currently no direct consumer pharmacogenomics tests. Um, there used to be before 2013, um, but because of the FDA's uh, banning of 23andMe, they were taken off the market or instead of being uh, uh, marketed directly towards the consumer, uh, they have to get, uh, they're, they're marketed towards healthcare providers and a patient would need to get a doctor's approval before the company uh, would be qualified to um, do the test. So the reason why the FDA took, uh, took away their, uh, uh, so part of the reason why um, pharmacogenomics results are not offered still um, is because the FDA and many, many providers are concerned that direct consumer pharmacogenetic testing um, will make people stop taking their medications. Um, they might not understand their results very well, so they could see something that says that they might not react well to a medication that they're currently taking, and what if they stop taking that medication because of something they saw um, from one of these sites. Um, other genetic health results aren't very actionable, so if you uh, see on 23andMe that you're at higher risk of getting uh, breast cancer based on those uh, BRCA variants, Without seeing a doctor, the most you could probably do is just be healthier, eat healthier, exercise, take care of yourself, do whatever Facebook says will help cancer at that moment. But generally, anything you would do, you would have to see a doctor first. The thing with pharmacogenomics results is you don't actually have to tell your doctor that you stopped taking a medication. You don't have to see your doctor for years after, after stopping that medication. So that has much more serious side effects than knowing your risk of something. Um, and stopping some medications can be lethal, um, depending on uh, which medication. You know, There could be lots of adverse effects based on stopping that medication. If you stop taking your heart medication, it's not good, right? Um, one study found that um, before 23 and we updated their health testing results, so the study took place before 2013 and 2011 and 2012 when they were still offering the results, um, less than 1% of patients made changes to their medications without a physician supervision. 1% is still kind of a lot um, without consulting a, a doctor before. Um, over 90% of the people tested had at least one uh, result that was a variant. So of those people, over 90% had something that they could change, but less than 1% actually changed it without consulting a doctor. Um, so that 
issue is still there. Now there is one test that 23andMe does provide and it is the alcohol flush report. Um, so alcohol flushing is um, when someone consumes alcohol, even a small amount, and their face gets really red and heated, um, which is most common in people of East Asian descent. So that's not, you know, when you drink too much and you get a red face, but when only a few sips causes your face to get red. Um, and this is taken right from 23andMe kind of giving a good uh, explanation of what it is, right? Small amount. Um, and people who experience this alcohol flush might also experience headaches, nausea, and sleepiness more rapidly than just an average person consuming alcohol. Um, and so that flush reaction has been linked to this gene, and it contains instructions for making an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. That enzyme breaks down acetaldehyde, which is the harmful product of alcohol metabolism. That is the product that causes the flushing. And when normal people drink too much, it can cause a buildup of that as well. It just takes much longer. So 23andMe does not have my awesome graphics, um, but that right there would represent our drug or alcohol. That is the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. And that converts alcohol I have too many clicks in there, um, into acetaldehyde. That is the harmful byproduct. But then normally, aldehyde dehydrogenase will convert that active product into a non-active product that then gets eliminated. Now people who, uh, who don't have normal uh, alcohol metabolism, that enzyme uh, is not as functional, which causes a buildup of acetaldehyde, and that causes the redness in the face and the flushing. This is taken directly from 23andMe, and they do a really good job of explaining um, what alcohol flush reaction is, what it does, how it happens. Um, this is just for the people who don't have 23andMe and who might be interested in what kind of information they provide. Um, so I did not post all of their fun facts and whatnot, but they do provide pretty good explanations. Um, and there you'll see that that is where the uh, SNP variation is. So people with two, G, two Gs um, in that location are unlikely to flush after drinking alcohol, um, whereas people with one or two A's are increasingly likely to flush. So they also have scientific details. So again, you'll see that they mention the gene, the exact SNP that they're looking at, the two copies, the biological explanation, so they go more in depth there. Substitution, so the G becomes an A, um, and it's on chromosome 12. And then you'll see they also give you a percentage of uh, 23MA customers that have that vari variant. Um, so that confirms that um, it's mostly seen in people with East Asian ancestry. So 23ME has some limits. Um, they don't test all currently known variants um, for all of these uh, uh, associations. Um, or they, they wouldn't be able to um, for all currently known variants because the research is ongoing and um, it would take time for them to update. And um, for some uh, uh, Variants, uh, 23andMe is not the correct platform to use, so 23andMe only tests those individual SNPs, 
whereas um, some associations would require uh, sequencing or other forms of testing the DNA um, that 23andMe would not be able to provide. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, some of the results are based on SNPs that are assumed to be strongly linked to the functional variant. Those are called tagging SNPs. Um, that was on the previous slide with that whole list of um, SNPs that they use specifically. Um, some of those linkages are not always correct. So some of them might only be linked 99% of the time, but what about that other 1%? Um, in which case having a sequence might be uh, more beneficial because for those 1% of people in which it's not linked, um, that would be a more effective way of testing them individually before you make medical decisions. Um, and then also those tagging SNPs can vary among populations. So maybe for 99% of Caucasians, those two SNPs are linked together, but maybe for only 50% of East Asians, are they actually linked together? Um, and those types of studies uh, would have to be done in large populations, large sample sizes, um, in order to actually be able to um, uh, use those SNPs, um, which is why in testing people individually um, and sequencing their DNA might be more effective. Um, and then also 23andMe um, is not a clinician. Um, some results can be very difficult to interpret, especially in terms of their clinical application. Um, you might know uh, that you have that certain SNP, that you might be a poor or rapid metabolizer, but what does that mean? What does that mean for what drugs you take? You would have to talk to someone who knows more about that medication than you. Um, and 23andMe does not quite have the platform to do that. So even if they gave that information, how beneficial is it? Um, and so there has been some controversy about direct consumer uh, accuracy. So um, this study was published this year and it's titled False positive results released by direct consumer genetic tests highlight the importance of clinical confirmation testing for appropriate patient care. Sounds normal, but then if you look in the media, they take that title and they turn it into up to 40% of at home genetic test results may be false positives. So that caused uh, quite a lot of media to comment. Um, social media and news sources. Um, I think that is from the Huffington Post, possibly. Um, but basically, major news sources were taking this information and seeing it as this, meaning that they were uh, saying that possibly 40% of their results are not true. Um, 23andMe refuted those claims uh, because this original study actually used um, multiple testing companies, not just 23andMe, and they also used third-party interpreters, meaning um, sites that would take that raw genetic data from 23andMe and then give their own interpretations of what that means. One of those sites is Prometheus, um, which is one of those uh, resources that I was talking about at the beginning. They analyzed the raw genetic data from 23andMe, Ancestry, other testing platforms, uh, whatever will, um, uh, whatever they will take. Um, the most recent cost of using Prometheus is $12, though it's sometimes offered at a discount or free. Though, of course, you would have to actually do the genetic test before you do Prometheus. Um, and they use a database called Snipedia, which you might be able to see from the Pedia part, uh, is similar to Wikipedia in that anyone can add information or edit this information. 
um, and not all the information is accurate. Um, so this is an example of where you could uh, download your raw genetic data from 23andMe. They allow you to either browse your raw genetic data so you can um, type in the gene or the SNP that you want to uh, know more about um, in that search or you can just download it and then you can also connect your 23andMe account to Prometheus without having to actually download the data um, now. And these are examples of the types of reports that, 20, uh, that Prometheus uh, gives you. It's kind of like a long scrolling list of reports kind of like these. Um, and so, I don't know, can you guys read that? Um, anyways, that says, um, poor metabolizer of several popular medicines. It's a little vague. Um, someone could look at that and think, well, maybe I should just stop taking all my medicines because obviously I'm a poor metabolizer of several of them. Um, and now they go more into depth and you can click on the links and go to Snippedia, and Snippedia actually provides a long list of sources that they, uh, that they use, lots of uh, uh, scientific literature that they use, but a lot of it is difficult to understand at this level, right? It is not very user-friendly. Um, and then down here, um, this SNP is actually used by 23andMe, actually no, this SNP is used by 23andMe, sorry. Um, this is a SNP that they use to test uh, uh, your uh, um, metabolism of clopidogrel or Plavix, which was one of the drugs that I talked about earlier. Um, this SNP is uh, related to uh, tacrolimus, which is one of the other drugs that I was talking about. And interestingly, they label this as bad, um, the GG variant, which is 90% of Caucasian, um, which is, that is the variant that about 90% of Caucasians have. So that, in this case, would be considered a normal metabolizer um, for, oh, oh sorry. Um, so, sorry, not a normal metabolizer, but a normal population that would take the medication. So, um, you might look at this as bad, but uh, the medication guidelines are based off of people who are this genetic variant. And then here's another example of um, confusing results. The title says, you'll live three, three years longer and chemotherapy is more effective if you have this variant. Um, but then in the first sentence, it says you're at increased risk for breast cancer. So, which is it? Um, and then here's an example of a uh, statin-induced myopathy result that Prometheus gives. Um, this SNP is one that 23andMe uses um, as well. And statin-induced myopathy, um, Statins are used to lower your cholesterol and are used in lots of people with heart issues. Um, and statin-induced myopathy is a possible adverse drug reaction that can happen to people who take statins, more specifically simvastatin, or most, most commonly simvastatin, um, and that is uh, muscle pain or muscle weakness. Um, and the FDA has not published any official guidelines for this gene drug interaction, but uh, CPIC has, which, as I said before, was one of those um, major, uh, uh, not companies, uh, 
organizations that produces those uh, guidelines. Um, and you'll see here, in very poor wording, it says that uh, it might be better to prescribe a lower dose or consider alter alternative statins. Um, and so CPIC and PharmGKB, um, CPIC is, stands for the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. Um, and PharmGKB stands for the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base. It is open to the public and relatively user-friendly. Um, and they compile pharmacogenetic data um, from the guidelines published by CPIC as well as the FDA and a few other um, important players in pharmacogenomics. So they comb through all of the primary literature, meaning all of those research studies. They take out whatever is relevant to uh, whatever they are wanting to know more about. Then they annotate it um, and interpret it. And then they publish guidelines on how to best implement that in practice. So PharmGKB has annotated almost 500 drug labels. Um, they have published a 100 dosing guidelines, meaning um, they uh, explain if you have someone who has these functional variants, what would you do? Would you increase the dose? Would you use a different medication? Would you um, try something else? Um, and the pathways are uh, basically just visual explanations of how um, it goes from the gene to the uh, response. Um, and I'll have an example of kind of what that looks like in the next slide. And there are over 641 drugs that are associated with uh, variant annotations. So a lot of medications. Um, so like I said before, simvastatin is uh, the primary medication associated with statin-induced myopathy. Um, and they give, PharmGKB gives an overview. They give the prescribing information, the drug labels, clinical and variant annotations. And then they'll actually provide all of the literature that they use to make those uh, uh, recommendations. And here's the image of that pathway. Um, so in this case, it's not actually uh, the enzyme um, that's uh, the metabolizing enzyme. It's actually a uh, um, transporter that affects how well you metabolize, how well the uh, drug is, how effective it is. Um, and this is an example of the kind of results they give here. Um, so they do similar to what 23andMe does. They'll give you the alleles um, and what that means for those patients. Um, it's a toxicity. They have levels of evidence. So they rate uh, how, um, how confident they are that this actually makes a difference. Um, and then they give you the variant that they test. Uh, which is the same variant that 23andMe tests. Um, and then, like I said, they will give you the evidence. So this is the, what, the main study that they took it from, as well as lots and lots of other studies. And then they'll give you their interpretations of what that means. So you can go back and check um, how much you agree with their interpretation. And so clinicians use those uh, resources to make their suggestions. Um, the University of Iowa um, has their own pharmacogenetic testing service um, that surprisingly they actually advertise their cost, which is $495. Um, I was surprised by that because most costs from the doctor are not advertised. You find out after the fact when you get the bill. <laughs> um, and 
these diagnostic tests are held to a higher standard than um, other than consumer testing companies. Um, test results can be reported in person by a physician, which is nice about clinical testing. Um, you would have to have the physician um, talk to you beforehand and after. Um, and then there are also, as I mentioned, private companies that provide doctor prescribed results for um, uh, places that might not have their own um, genetic testing services. So UIHC is lucky enough to have their own, but uh, possibly your family doctor or um, rural areas might not have access to that. Um, and so UIHC um, screens for uh, clopidogrel or Plavix, which I've mentioned before, it's anti-clotting drug. Um, they test for multiple cancer drugs, um, immunosuppressants, tacrolimus is on there, test for opioids, codeine is on there, um, and then infectious disease, um, and a bunch of neurological and psychiatric drugs. So some barriers of uh, the clinician, there's generally a lack of knowledge. You'll see that um, among many doctors and pharmacists. Um, doctors and pharmacists are very, very smart and are very skilled at what they do, but there are lots of them that when they went to school, pharmacogenomics was not part of the curriculum. Um, and genetics might not have been part of the curriculum. Um, and so uh, physicians' knowledge of these pharmacogenetic tests might not be, um, might be a barrier into them and prevent them from ordering these types of tests. Um, ease of access to the proper tests and results. So like I said, um, UIHC has pretty good resources, but rural and family doctors might not have the same resources. Um, they might not want to order these tests because of insurance coverage. So they might not want to order this type of test or talk to you about these types of tests because it might cost a lot of money for certain patients and maybe your insurance will not cover it. Um, and then other factors like age, weight, and um, other things that go into uh, prescribing medications are more readily emphasized um, for good reason. Um, but generally, clinicians have used those for uh, most of their careers, and it seems to have worked. Um, most estimates of the percentage of physicians comfortable with ordering pharmacogenetic tests um, range anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. That was a little bit conservative. I just kind of looked at some um, uh, uh, studies that have uh, looked at that, and uh, it's hard to estimate how many people are comfortable with ordering tests, but in any way, it's not 100%. So there is more that we can do to educate people and let them know what pharmacogenomics is and how they can use it. And like I mentioned before, insurance. Um, federal laws ban health insurance companies from discriminating based on genetics, um, thanks to uh, the ACA and other laws. Um, but they do still have access to all clinical genetic tests. Um, so for people who are worried that some of those laws might change, um, it might be reasonable to have some fear that insurance companies will get this information and discriminate, um, raise costs and whatnot. Um, at this point, they can't. Um, and then also life and disability insurances are not included in these laws. So if your life insurance or disability insurance uh, provider wants to know whether or not you took these tests, um, they can get that information. How likely they are to um, raise prices based on pharmacogenetic results um, might not uh, be very high because hopefully 
getting those types of results will um, better aid therapy and will be better for the patient and for the insurance company. Um, but they might, there might be other genetic uh, data. So instead of doing a focused uh, genetic test, what if you get a, uh, like a whole exome test done, um, marketed as a pharmacogenetic test, and then it could have other information there. Um, and then health insurance may or may not pay for uh, alternatives to the medication. So um, without proof of ineffectiveness of preferred medications. So if you go to a doctor um, uh, and uh, you think, based on 23andMe, that you might not respond well to a certain drug, but if that's the primary drug that your insurance wants to pay for, um, they might not pay for alternatives before you try the original one. So in that case, you might uh, need to have a clinical test done, in which case all of these issues might come into play. And whether or not the health insurance will pay to have that test done is, again, the conundrum. And so a lot of pharmacogenomics advocates um, predict that in the future, hopefully everyone prescribed a medication um, with pharmacogenetic recommendations will get a genetic test that could be a, uh, attached to their electronic medical record, and that it can be pulled up whenever a new drug is prescribed for the rest of their lives. That way, you can test someone once, and for the rest of their lives, you'll be able to know what, how they might respond to a drug, and when you add more drugs to that list of drugs that we have information on, um, you can update that database. Um, there are still a lot of issues in that, and there's a very long way to go. Um, cost and data and a whole litany of other things that um, are preventing that from happening, um, but that's possibly what's in the future. And it's about the end of my presentation, um, but I encourage you to look into some of this stuff, but please do not change any of your medications. I do not want to be liable. Um, <laughs> Please talk to your doctor. Um, the way I look at it, most of these tests are a good conversation starter. So sure, go ahead and use Prometheus or look into your raw genetic data on 23andMe and talk to your doctor about it. Um, they might know what uh, is going on, maybe not, but it's a good conversation. Um, and like I said, if you're taking any of these medications now, it's probably already working for you. They don't pose an immediate threat. Keep taking them. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Can I use the analogy of like self-driving cars? Um, would you say that we're somewhere near where we are with self-driving cars? That it's going to take some time before this is at a stage where it's really readily useful and available to people. That it's going to take more research and more time and money and laws to catch up with what's going on and that kind of thing. Laws have to catch up, and then also. It depends on which medication. So there are some medications where the FDA said you have to test someone's genes in order to use that medication because of the possible side effects or its effectiveness. Um, generally, that's for cancer drugs. Um, that's probably the most forward-moving uh, section of pharmacogenetics. Um, as far as the everyday family doctor use, definitely has a way to go. I'm trying to be obedient. Um, I, I, I do not have the B, 
B BRCA gene in either and but my children got a big kick out of this disclaimer and I'd like you to comment on it. You do not have the three genetic variants we tested. However, more than a thousand variants in these two genes are known to increase cancer risk. So you could still have a variant not included in this test. And also, in addition, most cases of breast and ovarian cancer are not caused by inherited variants. So women without a variant are still at risk of developing these cancers. Um, so maybe just comment on the meaningfulness in this early stage of, because I think they tested me for the, the, these breast cancer genes maybe in 2006, a long time ago, and I didn't have them. And it just turns out 23andMe added it to the bunch. But I'm just wondering, you know, is it any more meaningful than it was in 2006 if there's still a thousand variations out there? Well, so if you have those variations of those three, it can be useful. If, uh, but like you said, there are lots of variants. Um, so that was part of the limits of 23andMe is they don't test all the variants. Um, generally, if you go to a doctor, um, they'll order uh, specific tests that might be more applicable to you. Um, so for Burqa, um, those three variants are most common in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. Um, so if your doctor knows you have a history of uh, a history of Ashkenazi Jew, they might test those variants. Um, so that's where the doctor would help um, pick which uh, variants to test for. And um, yeah, like they said, um, they don't cover everything, and especially for Burqa, it's only an increased risk. So. Um, I was just going to add that, um, so cancer is inherently a genetic disease, even if it's not inherited because it starts with mutations in cells in your body. So that's been studied more than probably any other type of disease at that level. So there's, there's, a, there's thousands of ways for it to happen. And so it may be that pharmacogenomics, like you, you, that there, it may be especially limited actually relative to other types of diseases that you inherit a, a variant and you're just born unable to do something a certain way. Um, but with cancer, it's, it's a matter of just getting a, a mutation somewhere in, in your body, in some cell, and then that makes the cell start behaving differently. So it's, I, 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 I'm also skeptical a little bit that it's gonna be very helpful for, for that. It, you'd have to really be doing sequencing of your genome across your body throughout your whole life to, to try to predict when that's gonna happen. Yeah, and also for uh, that example of like statin-induced myopathy, um, they said 17 times greater risk um, for people who have those uh, variants. Um, but there are other things that go into that. So um, people of a certain age might be more likely to have statin-induced myopathy. It's not necessarily causal for some of these um, results. It's just associated with an increased risk of. So there are other factors that would um, go into play. So people who don't have those variants might still have statin-induced myopathy, just like people without those variants might still have breast cancer. It's just something to talk to your doctor about again. I, I did just recently get this book, uh, which is by David Reich, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past. And he does devote a chapter to the caste system in India and how they're kind of a bottleneck. They're, very, they're kind of a bottleneck, a series actually, of bottleneck populations that they discovered 
One particular cast has a, a area has a terrible reaction to a certain type of anesthesia, so they discovered that that they have a certain type of anesthesia, they risk having a fatal stroke. So that's I guess is in the works. Trying to find out more about that in India, they're trying to get their own genetic laboratories going. And uh, have you have you heard anything about that or? Um, not about that particular case, but there's lots of variants that are specific to populations. So you saw with that alcohol flush syndrome, it's almost primarily in East Asian uh, descent. So um, that's another way some uh, doctors might decide which medications to use. Um, it's based on population, because that could be an indicator whether or not someone should be tested. Well, if there's no more questions, let's thank Alana again.